Okay. Alright, I gotta shoot this with a sissy glove on. Yeah, because you're such a wuss. Real men don't use gloves, you know. <laughs> Thanks. Ryan Ham here, and what you see before you is a collection of Colts. Uh, specifically, we have uh, this uh, real interesting, uh, it's a little beat up, but it's still a real interesting uh, Colt 1903 in 32 caliber, made in 1922. Uh, we have a uh, uh, Colt uh, Lawman Mark III in 357 Magnum caliber. And uh, what you see here is a, a very interesting Colt. It is an AR-15. For all you guys that say you have an AR-15, you may not, because yours may not say Colt AR-15 on the side. Yeah, and then there's a, and this is a real boring Colt in the, in the middle, a Colt 45. Oh, I forgot about that. I have got some uh, Colt 45 malt liquor, Colt 45, for that dynamite taste. And uh, we are going to do a video. At, you know, I, uh, I'm out of practice. Uh, I haven't done a YouTube video in a while, so I, I think I'll do it on the boring gun. Uh, well, let's go ahead and look at the uh, Colt 1911. Gonna... Actual Colt, actual model 1911, no A1, no modifications. It's beautiful. Let's take a look. So uh, sometime around the late 1800s, around 18, uh, 1895, somewhere around that time, uh, uh, John Moses Browning, you may have heard of him, uh, he, he did a little tinkering around with uh, some automatic firearms and uh, uh, eventually he got good enough to uh, make a gun for Colt, the Colt Model 1895, and that was a uh, machine gun. And for around the next 10, 15, 20 years, uh, that was pretty much all that John Moses Browning would design. A uh, bunch of automatics in a row, and, and, and a lot of good ones. And come around uh, 1899, he, uh, he came up with a pistol, that pistol known as the uh, 1899 or 1900 or uh, whatever you want to look it up. There's there's some different versions that uh, that gun came out and it was the first really practical successful modern automatic pistol introduced uh, such things as the uh, the slide which encompassed the uh, breech face of the gun it encompassed the barrel and the the firing pin in, in that case or striker the whole slide would move to operate the gun and unlock it and, and, and close it and all that. And you might take that for granted now and, and, and talk about Gaston Glock and all these modern pistols, but every one of them, any pistol made today, owes something, uh, if not almost everything, to John Moses Browning. Well, the Army came up with a requirement after having some bad times in the Philippines with the natives. The United States Army decided that it wanted a heavier caliber pistol. Uh, and they specifically wanted a semi-automatic pistol and one that would chamber a 45 caliber cartridge. Uh, this is what John Browning came up with. It's the 45 automatic uh, Colt pistol. What we're looking at is a, a big bullet at about 800 feet per second, 230 grains. This gun itself was made in 1918 for World War I. This belongs to a friend of mine and we took it out shooting and uh, throughout the video I will probably roll shooting uh, footage of it in there and uh, towards the end I think we'll do some high-speed video it's a it's kind of old and janky high-speed video but it, it'll work uh, for our purposes okay Jim you're on camera now again yeah so this is a 1918 made Colt 1911 <laughs> well that works nicely hey it works I shake like a leaf. This is terrible. So how long has it been since you shot that gun? Oh, probably about three, four years. So there were three primary changes uh, to the M1911 in order to make it an M1911A1. 
after World War I, they decided that there were some features that they wanted to adjust to make them better. The, the three features are the curved back strap, and uh, that basically uh, changed the grip angle to a little bit of a more shallow angle, make it easier, more ergonomic. And another ergonomic change would be the extension of the grip safety. The little nub on, on the back there um, is a real problem for people like me because when my hand goes there, um, the, the back of my hand wraps around that happens to be where the hammer goes. And it goes down there and it just destroys my hand. It just pinches it. Not everybody has that problem. The owner of this gun does not have that problem. He kids me about it in the video, as you'll see. And the third change would be that the trigger uh, was shortened. All of these features are uh, absent from this gun. Uh, this is an original gun. And if you would like to take a closer look, there's the serial number on it. I've concealed the last three digits because this is not my gun. This is a borrowed gun. And uh, that date, if you look it up, it puts it right in the March, April, uh, May time frame of 1918. Uh, the uh, rampant cult there uh, and its location and the other markings on the gun uh, those would all coincide with a gun made in 1918s so there's the muzzle of the gun again i am not going to shoot you i am not behind the camera i am below the camera if you believe it is about the camera is mounted uh, vertically but there you go on that there's the front sight there's the markings on if it will focus. There's the markings on the right side of the gun. Uh, there is the rear sight. It's got a little damage to it. Uh, there is the hammer. There's a uh, firing pin plate there. There's also the extractor that goes down here. And we'll take it apart in a minute and we'll show you all this. And uh, there's your little grip safety uh, uh, pinching thing. And, and if you look where my hand goes, it's uh, it's right in the path. I don't even want to cock the hammer with my hand there. It's uh, it's that bad. Uh, Real men don't use clubs, you know. <laughs> Thanks. Truth hurts, you know. You ready? Go. The original thumb safety is here. It's a, it's short compared to any modern ones. Um, this is the grip safety on my uh, model 1991. The original grips are still here. They are the uh, they have the little diamond formation here. Uh, and there you go. Uh, well, let's disassemble this thing. Uh, the first step is to make make sure the gun is unloaded. You can see it's it's empty. Uh, so once you make sure it's empty, you want to wear safety glasses. And the first step is to take the plug here and you want to push that in and you want to rotate the barrel bushing clockwise. Uh, be careful that what the reason I say to wear glasses on this is because that plug will come shooting out of there with all the power that it takes to operate this gun uh, and uh, put your eye out <laughs> or uh, hit the ceiling and disappear. Uh, you're not going to like it. Uh, so push down with uh, with something and rotate that and then when you rotate it most of the way and you see how it catches right there it'll catch on the edge there uh, you could do that to rest but you want to definitely have something solid over the top of it when you push it the rest of the way so that's as far as it goes and I'll just ease the spring up like that um, so that that frees all the all the tension on the slide then you can take your safety off and you want to withdraw your slide. What you want to do is there's this little, there's this little tiny semicircular cutout here. We're not talking this, not the one with the angles on it. That's where the slide catch catches on when the magazine is empty. We're talking about this. That's a little disassembly notch there, and we want to line that up with the back of your slide catch. So line it up like this, and right there. So once it's lined up like that, you push it through from the other side. It, uh, it sticks out significantly. You can just push it through from the other side like that. And, uh, and then just pull that out. That is biased by this little tiny spring and plunger here. 
Okay, then you can just withdraw the slide and pull it off the front of the gun. So the parts we have here are the plug, which I've already uh, shown you. We have the recoil spring guide, which is this part right here. We'll just lift that up and pull that, that spring out. So on the front of the barrel, we've got our uh, turned clockwise barrel bushing. You want to turn that counterclockwise to about there. It's about the four or five o'clock position. And then you can pull that straight out the front. There's that little link there. That is the, uh, that needs to go slide down like this. Then you push the barrel up just a little bit like that through the ejection board is where I'm pushing it up just a little bit like that and then slide it forward. And then once you slide it forward, you can slide it all the way out of the gun. So when the gun is together, the, the uh, slide stop pin goes through that swinging link. And as the barrel goes back, it has to swing and, and drop down. Uh, and that, that clears these locking lugs from recesses in the frame. And those recesses should be pretty clear in there. Those recesses are here and here, and that's where the locking lugs go. Uh, in order to disassemble it further, uh, you can take the firing pin and the uh, extractor out, uh, which I will do here, uh, to get the firing pin out on this gun. Not on all guns. On some guns, there's a little plunger over here, uh, which I can show you. Okay, so this is my Series 80, and on my Series 80, there's this little plunger here, like a Glock. That little plunger makes disassembly a little difficult, but, uh, we, but we don't need to worry about that on our gun. On, on our gun, what we're going to do is we're going to take a non-marring tool of some sort. This is a dull screwdriver, and we're going to push that firing pin in and then pull that plate down. When we do that, again, we've still got our safety glasses on, right? <laughs> when we do that, that little firing pin can shoot out the back, destroy your camera, go through your skull, uh, put a hole in the roof. What we want to do is we want to put our finger over the top of it while at the same time pulling that, that plate down. And you hear it pop there. And it just sticks out a little bit when it pops. Uh, here's the, here's the, the firing pin plate there. And then you could just withdraw your firing pin, and there's a firing pin spring on there. So in order to get the extractor out, you'll pry inside the groove there. Um, some of them come out easier than others, but uh, like this one. Um, and then you get it a little bit out, and that'll pull all the way out. Hopefully that was all on camera. This is it. There's no spring or anything like that. This is a spring-tensioned uh, arm here. That spring-tensioned arm puts pressure on the case, which will be inside the chamber, so that it can withdraw, withdraw that. Um, and this will move that way under spring tension uh, provided by the extractor itself. That extractor is held in the gun by the groove on the extractor there, and the plate will come up and hold that in. And that is as fully disassembled as I am going to get this gun for you today. Okay, let's have a look at all the markings. All right, the first marking on here is going to be United States property. It's uh, proudly put there. It's not United States property anymore, but they were required to mark them that way. The next marking we're going to look at here is the inspector's mark. Uh, that is John M. Gilbert. On the top of the gun, we can see a couple of inspector's marks. There is an H for Francis L. Hosmer and he was the ordnance inspector. The G indicates that this was for a uh, government uh, contract. There is a seven there. I have no idea what that seven is. You can tell me in the comments, but please look in the, uh, look in the description to see if I already know, instead of having 40 different comments that say, you know, it was built on the seventh day of the week or something like that. Uh, there is an overstamped eight. It looks like it's got two stampings there. I also do not know what that eight means. Again, if it was made on the eighth day of the week, please check in the description to see if I already know instead of writing it down in the comments for a hundred times. On the other side of the gun, you can see the uh, the serial number. Uh, 
So what we have here on the slide is model of 1911 U.S. Army. I'm turning it over, you've got the patent dates. Feel free to look all this stuff up if you'd like, but there were differences in where the the rampant cult was placed, and I'll show you the rampant cult on this one. So uh, that is the way the rampant cult looks on this gun. In some of them it'll have a circle, in some of them it is located uh, right here. In some of them uh, it is not present at all if it wasn't made by Colt. <laughs> so if you have a gun that wasn't made by Colt, uh, sorry, you don't get a rampant Colt. Of course we have Colt's PTFAMFGCO, and that's Colt's Patent Firearms Manufacturing Company in Hartford, Connecticut, USA. At the rear of the gun we have an H, it's right above the firing pin area there. Again, that's uh, Francis L. Hosmer. Um, on the underside of the frame we have, uh, that's unintelligible, I'm not sure if that's a tooling mark or, mark or not. That is the letter A. That is the number 5. Uh, that looks uh, like an errant mark. I don't know exactly what that is. And finally, on the barrel, we have there you go. That's an overstamped H N A P. Again, for Frank L. Hosmer, and the P is a proof mark. So now I'm going to reassemble the gun in reverse order from what I did before, and we'll be right back. While I have the gun up there, let me point out another feature that I did not point out before. Uh, that is that these, uh, the the safety, the thumb safety, is knurled right there. Also knurled. And let's contrast that to my 1991. And you see that uh, there's just uh, styrations cut in it rather than uh, knurling. Uh, so now I'd like to go through some of the differences you'll see on modern guns. Um, if you... Uh, if you see modern guns, a lot of them will have this uh, this beaver tail here. Uh, if you contrast them, uh, this is just the short uh, stub here, and this beaver tail goes all the way out back here. You also notice the hammer is different. This one's got a spur. This one they call it the commander style, and that's got a hole in it. Uh, that spur protects uh, wimps like me, you know, uh, gigantic people with large hands, uh, from getting their hand caught in there. So another feature that's uh, that's new is this. This is called a lowered and flared ejection port. If you if you see this line here, that's the the line where the machining uh, the flat on the side of the the slide stops. If you look up here, if you look up here, the machining on the side of the slide stops here. But instead of just riding that line, the ejection port is cut down. Uh, that's a, a lowered uh, ejection port, and the lowered ejection port helps with ejection. It keeps the brass uh, from striking the side of the slide here. That's one other thing you might notice is the, the sights. On the newer 1991, the sights are much higher. Uh, the notch is, is square. Those tiny front sights there uh, were problematic. They were hard to see, and again, uh, that is something they changed later on in, in production. So I hope you've enjoyed our trip down the rabbit hole today of the Model 1911. Uh, the main attraction uh, to this gun over the years has, has been the fact that the U.S. military used it for uh, a long time. Uh, basically from adoption in 1911 uh, all the way through to the Gulf War and it has had some sprinklings of use uh, beyond the Gulf War. When I say the Gulf War, I mean Gulf War One, the one I was in, uh, in 1991, 92, uh, the line in the sand. Uh, when was that? Uh, this is Ryan Ham. I'll see you at the range. So this is not the original clip that goes with the Model 1911. Hey, honey, can you hand me the uh, the 45 clip? Yeah, yeah, the the World War One one. Yeah, that one. Okay, cool. Uh, uh, 
Uh, uh, honey, hand me the other. No, the the the, the nineteen the eleven clip, the the one the one that they they'd issue that clip to you in nineteen eleven. Yeah, I know. I, I, I know. Nineteen. Yes, it was around in 1903. I know. I understand. Royalties to the Mauser Company. I, I understand this. But this, this. Okay. Okay. I'm sure there's another 45 clip. Or, okay, come on. Come, yeah, come on. Uh, yeah. All right. Hey, babe. Hand me my Colt 45. Works every time. I'd like, you, I'd like to introduce you to Juju Bees. This is a dog. He's a very cute dog. Yes, he is. Uh, Juju Bees is a new member of our family. He's actually been with us for a while, but I haven't been doing YouTube videos for a while. Yeah, so, this is my gun dog. He's a very good boy. And we love him. So one of the cool things about Colts is they've got this uh, this little mascot on the back here, the rampant. It's not focusing too well. Hold on, let me uh, let me, let me get a little closer look here. Yeah, Colt Forty Five. Notice that uh, this Colt happens to be a bit jacked. I think he's been drinking the Colt 45. Works every time. So Jujubees, what do you think of the 1911? No, don't lick the knife. No, don't, no, don't lick the 